I did not take a good photo of you, so you can make sure you have a great photo of me. That would be really appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> it's our choice. Mine was like so far away. And I was like, yeah, Candace, that was bad. <laughs> I didn't want to like sneak off and like having people be like, what is she doing? Like on the side. So yeah. Apparently, my husband and toddler are watching right now. Oh my god, that's so cute. <laughs> Everyone, mic on? No, I think you might need to. I think I am on. Yeah, maybe it's. I think this is. I suspect this is just. Is this mic working? Excellent. Hi. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. Can you hear me all right in the back? Great. Thank you. I don't really know how the clapping thing works, but I appreciate the assistance. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. I am Kate McFarlane, a housing researcher with the Sightline Institute. I'm down from Seattle for Unity Town. Thrilled to be here. Uh, thrilled to be moderating this panel on inclusionary housing. It's a dial, not a switch. And in particular, we'll be starting off the conversation using Oregon and Portland as an example. Um, just to welcome everyone again, as Steph and Aaron talked about, our goal is to have a conversation and a dialogue, and we've got many brilliant people here in the room with their own ex lessons learned and experience and insight on IZ. So, after we hear from our panelists to get us started, we really look forward to having a conversation, hearing your great questions, and your hot takes as well. Um, so despite the format, we hope to be able to actually talk to each other. Uh, I think that's it for me. A little bit about my background. Prior to working at Sightline Institute, I was at Mapcraft and then Echo Northwest. So. My experience with inclusionary housing is primarily on the analyst side. So 
So running pro formas and plugging in different inclusionary housing scenarios to see how that might affect how things pencil out. Um, very excited to get this conversation started. So our panelists today are Vivian Satterfield with Verde. Vivian is a second generation Chinese American born and raised in Chicago. Since relocating to Portland in 2008, she has worked alongside community members at the intersection of environmental, racial, and economic justice, rooted in movement building principles and progressive values. Vivian is an organizer, policy shaper, and coalition builder. Um, and just to add, Vivian, you were previously with Opal, I believe, and helped pass the bill that lifted the ban on inclusionary housing yes. in the state. Uh, we also are thrilled to have Cassie Graves from Portland Housing Bureau. Cassie is the Housing Program Coordinator for the City of Portland's Inclusionary Housing Program and Development Incentives Programs. She started with the City of Portland to help develop the administrative side, side of the newly adopted Inclusionary Housing Program in February 2017. Previously, she worked at Home Forward with the project-based voucher program and as a loss mitigation counselor for the Homeowners Hope Hotline. And so at Portland Housing Bureau, Cassie's really been on the front lines of seeing how this has played out and is going to tell us about that as well. So with that, I will turn it over to Vivian. Great. Um, thanks so much. Uh, it's so great to see so many of you here. I was just remarking to my uh, fellow panelists here that there's so many of you who could actually be here because you're practitioners, you know, you're working you know, at the city, actually trying to implement inclusionary housing. Uh, you might be from the private sector. Um, you've written about it and analyzed it, Michael. So, you know, I'm, I just, you know, I'm really flattered to be up here and feel like I, uh, my goal today is really to sort of share the history of the inclusionary zoning uh, campaign and what it took to lift it. And y'all, it's been a few years since that time, so I had to create some crib notes for myself, so please extend your grace as I sort of have to remember what we did a number of years ago um, to help lift the statewide ban. But it's really great to talk about something that consumed so much of my uh, organizing time and intellectual space um, <laughs> for a while. And then much like any other organizer, when you've done the campaign, you're just like, <laughs> on to the next um, grad school crash course on whatever it is. So um, I'm a little rusty, but I'm looking forward to getting warmed up. It's really wonderful to be here alongside Cassie, who is you know really uh, fingers deep in inclusionary housing now and the policy. Um, and it's wonderful to see the tool being utilized. Um, and yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so Oregon, what a funny state. Um, I'm originally not from Oregon. I've learned a lot about how uh, policy has been enacted here. And something I find really interesting about statewide politics is the ease in which uh, preemptions and bans can happen uh, here. So let's, let's think about why we had to go to the state in order to lift the statewide ban, which was uh, enacted for 17 years, um, why that happened. So uh, in 1973, uh, Oregon adopted SB 100, which really sets a lot of our land use uh, law and really set off a great debate about the urban growth boundary. And in the late 1990s, as a response to that, uh, our local elected regional government, Metro, initiated this process that would eventually lead to the adoption of the Regional Affordable Housing Strategy, RAHS. So that was an early regional framework that included originally affordable housing policies that in, in, uh, and looked at mandatory inclusionary housing. So you really have two forms of inclusionary housing. It can be mandated or it can be a voluntary process, but Metro was really looking at a whole suite of policies and just had that on the list. Um, and they were quickly served a legal appeal of this entire regional framework by various local jurisdictions. Um, and there's a number of mediations and negotiations that happened as a part of that. And any reference to a mandatory IZ, I'm going to use IZ and IH interchangeably, it's referring to the same tool. Um, so any reference to that mandatory policy was actually stripped from the final RAHS. So we can already see that there is a distrust, there are political um, machinations at play. 
And of course, with any uh, zoning, land use, housing policies, you always have sort of like the what is happening and then like what the counter forces are doing um, in that realm as well. So that's just something we should just be conscientious of. And I think a really in, uh, big part of framing inclusionary zoning here in Oregon. Um, so, you know, despite Metro having identified IZ as a potential tool to enact in this really broad range, uh, you know, strategy. Um, in 1999, the Oregon Home Builders Association worked with a Republican controlled uh, House and Senate in order to pass a statewide prohibition that would prevent jurisdictions from adopting policies that required housing set asides in private developments at target income levels. That sounds like IZ, right? So it was a yeah, it was a full preemption, um, and I think somewhere in my notes here I will eventually get to. Oh yeah, so the uh, the the ban on inclusionary housing was an ORS. Um, it's ORS one nine seven dash three zero nine. So that's when it was enacted. It was in nineteen ninety nine, um, and I really want to name who did it. So the Oregon Home Builders Association, because that would uh, they would turn out to be a formidable force in opposing um, the the campaign and a lot of the work that, that we did in order to lift the statewide ban. Um, now, what was happening with the regional affordable housing strategy? Metro was still going forward with that. It was eventually adopted in 2001, um, and it contained a lot of aspirational affordable housing production goals, but it really lacked any of the teeth to actually achieve those targets. And so um, that was continuing to move, but we have a ban on IZ. So what happened in the intervening 15 years? Uh, lots of rising rents and housing prices across the metro region um, and other housing markets across the state. This, the consequence of that was a lot of low and moderate income households were being gentrified out of, the, especially the inner core of Portland. And so various efforts by housing advocates throughout the 2000s really failed to make any progress on the issue. Um, and so at that time, in uh, 2010, I was the deputy director at Opal Environmental Justice Oregon, an environmental justice organization that primarily is known for organizing transit riders. So uh, we ran the Bus Riders Union. Uh, we were uh, launching campaigns and winning campaigns. If you took TriMet today, um, that transfer time that you get of two and a half hours, we did that. Uh, it used to be two hours. That extra half hour was a uh, you know, it was a response to our campaign for a fair transfer, um, our work to uh, hold TriMet accountable to a time-based system that really worked in the face of service cuts from the Great Recession. I'm bringing up all these things because 2008 feels like it was a long time ago, and of course we're now in another economic crisis um, that is again disproportionately impacting low and moderate households, disproportionately impacting black people, people of color, working households, folks with disabilities we're repeating a lot of the same patterns that we've seen historically happen. So in engaging and working with bus riders, and yeah, if you were riding transit at that time in East Portland, you probably ran into myself or any of my fellow organizers organizing transit riders directly. We were hearing stories, not just of people's transit experience, of how hard it was to get from one part of town to the other, of missed transfers, of waiting outside in the cold with no shelter, of, you know, uh, not even having bus stops. Um, we worked to also improve the, you know, what bus stops look like. We heard people say, I have never lived in this part of town before, and I can't afford any of the new housing that is now you know, being constructed in the inner part of Portland. My office at that time was uh, right down the street at uh, 50th and Division. Um, for Portlanders, you can remember when the Division Canyon, <laughs> when you know a lot of the new apartments were coming up and uh, sort of the NIMBY responses to that. And so you know, we were trying to think of how can we ensure that in all these new developments, and at one point we had over 20 some 20 plus cranes in the sky um, during this time, you know, how can we ensure that the folks that we're meeting on the bus and talking to, low and moderate income folks, can afford to rent and buy um, in these new apartments. And inclusionary zoning, you know, we're hearing about this tool from other parts of, this, of the parts of the country. Um, that's when we started looking at that. So in 2010, um, as an organizer with Opal, we worked alongside uh, the Community Alliance of Tenants. And they're now known as Unite Oregon, but at the time they were called the Center for Intercultural Organizing we decided to take up the issue and start organizing our communities. 
Uh, at the time, I just remember uh, CIO's offices was right across from PCC over on Killingsworth. And so, you know, even like where our offices were physically located and we were trying to, you know, organize our community, um, we were seeing a huge disconnect. Like we were able to, at one point, you know, walk out and just like meet people right away. And increasingly, we're like, here's the bus ticket to, to you know, take a 40 minute travel to come to our offices to organize. So we were also, you know, really swirling with this as well. So in, uh, we worked with, uh, in 2011, at the time, Representative Smith introduced uh, this, this bill, House Bill 3531, which would just be a clean lift, fully repeal the ORS. And the bill received an informational hearing. It was an opportunity for us to really rally um, a new uh, set of core partners to the issue. We really wanted to center racial and social justice and health equity advocates to, to understand what IZ was. Um, it was unsuccessful in getting anything more than a hearing. Uh, then in 2013, Representative Reardon uh, introduced another bill, uh, which actually garnered pretty strong support in the House. Um, the House Human Services and Housing Committee passed that bill, um, but it was forced to go to, back to committee for reconsideration, and it died without a hearing um, ever being made to the House floor. These are not things that you typically hear about when you talk about the campaigns, but I want to give you an insight into how many years it took and who we had to work with. And I want to really name and like uplift some of these champions because they, um, they did things that uh, were fairly audacious at that time. So, and also it took three tries. <laughs> so um, if any of you are connected to funders and whatnot, it's just a realization of like how it takes many, many tries and a, a continued momentum sometimes um, to, to move the dial. Then in 2015, Representative Williamson uh, championed House Bill 2564, which was then supported by the coalition that we had built. So there's a formal coalition. There's still like a zombie website that you can go to the Oregon Inclusionary Zoning Coalition uh, to look at. Um, that would that would was calling for the final repeal. It was looking for a clean lift again of this preemption, just striking the ORS. Um, and so, you know, 2015 is really where we gained the most momentum. So uh, we had over 300 community members gathering in, you know, spaces in East Portland to share with a panel of Oregon legislators what their experiences were with a full-blown housing crisis, how it was time to act. Um, we went ahead and continued to build our coalition with individuals, local governments, uh, and engaging with folks um, in Bend and in other parts of the state to really show this was not just a Portland issue. A lot of times working at the statewide level, the biggest hurdle you have to get over is to show that uh, it's not just a Portland specific issue that you're asking the state to solve, but that you're, you're enacting a solution that really works statewide. Um, and so, you know, local governments from Hood River to Lincoln County, Corvallis, and Milwaukee, um, and including uh, Portland here, all supported that clean lift of the bill. Um, and at this time, uh, Oregon and Texas were the only two states that didn't allow inclusionary zoning. So that was a really strong talking point for us. Um, I would also say that uh, local control was also a talking point we used a lot, especially with Republican uh, legislators to, to talk about the benefits of inclusionary housing. Um, so the bill finally did pass the Oregon House. I want to give a shout out to the leadership of, at that time, House Speaker Tina Kotek, Representative Alyssa Kinney-Geyer. Um, I happen to live in her district. Uh, it's now Representative Pham's district. And Jennifer Williamson and their colleagues were really organizing to do that. On the Senate side, uh, Senator Gelser led the effort to move our bill forward. But other senators ensured that the bill never actually reached a full vote. Um, so despite the statewide crisis in housing affordability, the Senate never took a position. It wasn't allowed to go to a vote. Um, and so, you know, it, we finally did get a, a lift of the inclusionary zoning, but it came with what's referred to as sideboards, so there's restrictions on it. Um, we knew at the time that that was going to be something that probably only Oregon as a jurisdiction was going to be able to work with and do anything with. We heard some grave disappointment, especially from growing metropolitan areas like Bend, um, that they weren't seeing the sort of development um, that Portland was in terms of, of its density of you know 20 plus units. Um, and so that was something that uh, we've all we recognized. It, it was it was sort of a compromise of knowing that this was one shot that we had to, after three years and going again and again um, in the legislature, 
uh, that we were really looking for for something to work with and it was a compromise it didn't feel great knowing that we'd be leading other parts of the state probably without the strength of the tool um, you know I find that it the, the, some of the talking points that we used was that it was highly customizable. Um, you can really use it to fit whatever the local jurisdiction is experiencing. Um, and having those restrictive sideboards on it uh, definitely made it difficult. But um, we finally did win. And then I worked with a number of folks, including some folks in this room, to sit on Portland's inclusionary zoning panel of experts um, in order to sort of craft what that would look like. But at that time, um, Oh my gosh, uh, uh, the housing bureau director was Kurt Krieger. Kurt Krieger, yep, um, and and other folks to do it. So uh, I probably went over my ten minutes in time, but wanted to go ahead and just give some of the background and then engage in this uh, conversation with what the current form of inclusionary zoning uh, looks like at the city of Portland. Thanks. Thanks, Vivian. I learned a lot with that too. Thanks to Vivian and a lot of you in this room. I. Oh, is this not working? Is it now? Okay. Try my, my like sexy radio voice or something. It doesn't exist. Um, uh, but, but thanks to a lot of people in this room even, I was brought on in 2017 to essentially administer the program. So hopefully I don't bore you too much because honestly I can put all of my friends to sleep when I start talking about this. Um, but I'm just going to briefly go through kind of once uh, Senate Bill 1533 was passed in February 2016, kind of what happened internally, right? Because everything exploded, right? We got the go ahead and um, some of the sideboards that Vivian was talking about was that um, we were given certain restrictions where I think in Portland, people wanted us to be able to maybe require more affordability is the biggest piece of feedback we've gotten. But there are certain pieces of what was passed that limit what we can do. Um, so I do want to touch on those. Uh, one of the big things is that we cannot require a project to restrict units below 80% MFI. So we can give options uh, that allow them to choose to do so, but we cannot require it. We also cannot require a building to restrict more than 20% of their units. Um, we are required to provide incentives like SDC exemptions, property tax exemptions, any kind of fee or waiver, and um, also required to provide a fee in lieu option. And a fee in lieu option, for anyone who doesn't know, is essentially they can pay a fee to not provide units. Um, a lot of, that leaves a lot of stuff to figure out though, right? What is the appropriate fee in lieu? How much should people pay? Um, it's stuff that we've had to figure out, um, sometimes quite publicly. <laughs> um, and sometimes we've been able to get a little grace, get a little headway, seeing the problem coming and been able to figure things out behind the scenes. Um, but essentially once February 2016, that Senate bill was passed, uh, the city of Portland entered a stakeholder process to develop that program. So in that, we needed to do a calibration study to determine what the fee in lieu was going to be. Um, that's where you'll see that inside Central City, I think, and there was also a ramp up period too to give some grace, but um, seeing if I can remember this off the top of my head. Uh, inside Central City, it's $23 per gross square foot of the residential and residential area of a building, which is a whole spreadsheet that we fill out. Um, <laughs> uh, and it's, it gets complicated really fast. Um, and then outside of Central City, it's $19 per gross square foot. And then there's another option, because projects that are under 20 units may want to buy density bonus and they pay into the affordable housing fund, specifically the inclusionary housing fund, and they pay $19 per bonus square foot, which is actually only the additional density that they want. Um, but any project that's actually subject has to pay the full amount um, on residential and residential related, which does not include hotel, office, um, any commercial space. So that was all figured out. Um, and then, you know, we also in the calibration study 
tried to figure out some additional incentives. Um, you know, uh, well, let me back that up. Incentives, but also like what our local policy objectives were. As I mentioned, Portlanders want more affordability. We want deeper affordability. And we want more family-sized units. There's a lot of pieces. Um, so part of what we did was we figured out what those additional program options would be, and that's where you start seeing 10% of the units at 60% MFI. There's off-site options. Um, and, and so all of that was developed um, and fine-tuned the incentives. How do we further incentivize people to actually provide units at 60%? So that's why the SDC waivers are actually tied to providing units at 60% or below. Um, and so there is a whole matrix of how all of the incentives fold into each of the options. Um, another local policy objective is reasonable equivalency, and that's probably our hottest topic. Um, because within that, we are really trying to figure out where the fine line is with what we require and how much we let the market just do what it does. Um, and so in that process, we figured out that zoning code and building code do not actually define what a bedroom is. So we got to do that ourselves, which is why if you ever want to read the administrative rules, you'll see, um, help you if you do. They were like 27 pages long. I hate having to go through them regularly. Um, but there's unit types, right? And we have lofted one bedroom, you know, lofted plus windowless one or two bedroom, all of these different unit types because we're trying to be flexible with what is being built. But we also had to draw a line of if you have a shotgun unit, with a bedroom in the middle that either doesn't have doors or is just enclosed in the middle of the unit, is that reasonably equivalent to a unit that has a bedroom on the outside where it has a window or a door to the outside? Do we count those as the same? Where if you know we're saying you need to provide a percentage of your units of each of the unit types, could we allow a developer to say, well, these are all one bedrooms. So I'll just provide the interior one bedrooms, right, where there's no windows. So that's where those unit types came from because these are the first projects coming in. Um, and and we, we kind of just had to draw a line and create boundaries to make sure that the units were reasonable equivalent. Also, unit sizes, square footage of the average square foot of the same unit type or same, technically it's, um, unit type with the same number of bedrooms. So all the one bedrooms are squished back together again. And you take the average of that and then 90, 95% now, because that's changed. Um, and, and that's how we come up with all these things, right? Um, sorry if I'm rambling a little bit. Well, There's a lot of information. Cassie, wasn't there also like in New York, within some of the inclusionary projects that you were seeing like the port or? Yeah, so that was the next one as well. Um, location in the building, how many units per floor. Um, you know, they can be stacked on top of each other, but we have a restriction that no more of 25% in terms of rental buildings can have their IH units. So no more than 25% of the total units per floor can be IH, right? Um, usually we don't ever come up with that. Um, against that, but that was directly in response to what was happening in New York. Right, like the concentration of all of like the affordable units on just perhaps a few floors so that mm -hmm. the luxury, mm -hmm. right, residents could bypass and never really have to interact with the same folks, so. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah, there is an exception for the top floor of a building. They do not have to have any IH units. They can also put all of the IH units on the top floor, technically, <laughs> if you wanna get them. Have, have you seen that yet? yet? No. <laughs> we have caught it. Actually, someone did try to put all of their IH units in the basement once, and we, we were able to say, actually, no, you can't do that. Um, uh, and then, you know, amenities and finishes, um, making sure that those units aren't falling apart. The other part about the program that we uh, implemented was floating. So we require that developers, if, well, I guess at this point, they're no longer developers. Once there's you know, units on the market, they have the building rented out. If there's a tenant in a unit that no longer income qualifies, 
then the owner is required to select the next same type unit that meets the mi minimum reasonable equivalency requirements and make that the IH unit. So essentially, those IH units are not stagnant. It's different with the home ownership side, which I probably won't talk a lot about today unless you guys have questions specifically about it because it is literally a whole other program because of how home ownership works. Um, and it, honestly, it's not widely used right now. We have a few units, but it's, it's, that's a whole other conversation, uh, which I can talk about, but not right now. Um, so at that point in time, um, you know, city council adopted the program in 2016. At that point, they also adopted and kind of threw in at the last minute the reconfiguration option, which is essentially taking, if your requirement for the building is two studios and two one bedrooms, but you have two bedrooms or three bedrooms or four bedrooms, you can take your four required units and provide them in larger type units. Right, um, so that was included at the last minute. It's been a really hot topic at city council when we bring the property tax exemption uh, projects in, um, specifically with multi because not all projects get the multiple unit limited tax exemption um, and not all of them get as much attention from city council. It really depends. But reconfiguration is something that some of the commissioners really want to, to pay a lot of attention to. Also, let's see. I think a big piece of this, um, you know, internally, we're rushing to write administrative rules. PHB before this was not engaged in any of the permit review. So we actually had to figure out how to even get involved with permit review, get reviewers hired, hello. Um, <laughs> and then um, also just figure out this whole new system. Um, anyone who's worked through permitting or worked internally in permitting knows how complicated it can be. Um, and that you know everyone's reviews depend on each other. So it was a huge puzzle to figure out. Um, on the same end, um, the development community, I think, understandably so, kind of panicked and said, if I have any project that would be subject to this, I think I need to try and get it in for a permit while I know what I'm required to provide because it does change the performa dramatically, right? And especially in the beginning, um, there was really not much known about the true impact on developments. So what we saw was over a 200% increase in two months of uh, permits coming in and getting vested, right? So um, through land use, they're actually submitting an application for um, their building permit. Um, what that looks like is about 5,000 units in about two months, which, I mean, totally swamped the system. Also led up to a lot of speculation that inclusionary housing was killing development, right? Everyone's seen the articles. <laughs> well, it was so interesting because, you know, um, being a part of the panel of experts, uh, one of the more prominent at the time, prominent uh, Portland developers, you know, said in, a, in the meeting, said, you can do whatever you want to do. We're going to blame IZ regardless. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it did take a while for, um, you know, permits to start coming in. It was very slow. I got to work on a lot of documents, applications. It was thrilling. Um, it's not thrilling. <laughs> um, but ultimately, I think it was about a year later, we really started seeing more of an uptick. And right now, we have 68 active permits that have IZ on them that we are currently working through. So PHB hasn't signed off. So it's a lot. And that's two people doing that work. Um, and um, we actually, if you want to cue the slide, I have some data in a nice format, I think. <laughs> um, we have a projected minimum, and, and projected minimum, if I can just explain this, because it sounds like a little wishy-washy. Essentially, these are all the permits that have come in to, um, to us through the permitting software. And 
the reason it's a projected minimum is because not all of the projects have actually submitted their inclusionary housing intake form. So we don't know what option they're going to choose. And we also haven't had an opportunity to review their plans is another um, reason why we have a projected minimum. So we just do a flat 8% on the units that we don't have enough information on. And usually that calculates out to be about accurate when you consider in reconfiguration and also people who choose to do 15 or 20% or 10%. Um, so we have uh, 1,557 IH units right now. Um, 475 units are actually currently on the market. Um, so that's fresh data. <laughs> Um, I think the most important thing that I've noted from the data is that our, our policies to incentivize developers to choose to restrict units at 60% or below have been working. Over 66% of the IH units are at 60%. And I think that's astounding because you're also looking at the fact that with a 60% MFI option, they're required to provide less units. Um, and I didn't do the calculation of how many projects then of the ratio of total number of projects that came in, have come in have chosen that option. But I mean, considering the total number of units, it, it is pretty dramatic. Um, and so I think that's been a success. Um, and also, despite the softening rents from COVID, we still see, and you can see from here, that with average new construction rent, which I think anyone who's looked to rent a unit in a new construction building can agree that it's very high, um, the 80% the and 60% restricted um, rent levels are still well below what you can get in a new building. Um, and we can't restrict IH units in existing buildings that were permitted or vested before 2017. So those units are all lost in a sense, right? Um, so we really are looking at still a huge success in terms of being able to provide workforce housing. And I think, you know, with the title of this um, whole presentation is that this is just a piece of the puzzle, right? We, inclusionary housing, the private market development, affordable housing, um, developers, it, I mean, we can only do so much, right? And, and with inclusionary housing, it cannot be expected to be the solution to everything. Um, it just isn't possible. And I don't think that we can incentivize to um, kind of offset the costs with developers um, to, to make it financially work out to say, restrict more units at a lower percentage. Um, it is, it's a big push, um, and I know that developers are making it work, and there's definitely some that have figured out a very smooth pathway through. Um, but yeah, I think overall, we are seeing some of it. I have some challenges that I've outlined, but I think, I don't know, I feel like we might wanna open it up for questions. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, let's. I had one question to get started. We'll do, if you would want to line up over here and talk into the microphone, that way, that way folks on the live stream will be able to hear. I think the context is really important. I mean, um, inclusionary zoning is a customizable tool. Uh, it is meant to grow and evolve as the market conditions change in a certain jurisdiction. And so um, the fact that we're going through a review, this is the time to do it. It's working actually exactly as you're supposed to do. Enact the tool, see how it works for a certain number of years. I think that a lot of practitioners say that in a hot housing market, you should be looking at about four years. Um, and so I think that it's, uh, it is time for review, and so it's working um, 
in, in that realm, and it has produced units. It has produced, you know, I'm actually going to stop saying units. It's produced homes for people who need them in the places that they want to live. Yeah, um, and, and just to clarify, the, there is another cali calibration study that's being started right now. Um, so I think in a year's time, hopefully, definitely, <laughs> um, we should have some actual data to share with the community. And you'll probably start seeing some more information about this calibration study. I think um, as, as a staff member, as someone who, who sees this, I mean, I definitely see the faults in the program. Like, I know where the holes are. Um, and I think... You want to name some names? I mean, the home ownership side is definitely a difficult one to, to make work. I think my biggest issue with the home ownership side, and I know a lot of my colleagues are, are right there with me, is that there is no um, opportunity for wealth generation with that side of the program um, because it's a 99 year uh, requirement. So until 99 years from now, no one's going to get anything above kind of just the increase in, um, uh, what is it, AMI, MFI? Yeah. yeah. So, so it really is limited and what they pay down on the mortgage. Um, and, and I think the other thing that has been just a sticking point for the program is feeling like we have to plug every hole when it, a certain development comes in that doesn't fit what I think maybe we had hoped would happen, but we have to realize that not every project that comes through is going to meet every single standard that we hope they would. This is still the, the private market and a, a free market. Yeah. Letter grade? Both of you? Oh my gosh! This is why I never wanted to be a teacher. I guess. I guess. Uh, I guess B. Yeah, I, I would say say B. Okay. Yeah. Great. First question. Okay. Um, my question was fairly similar to yours, Kate, but I'm going to ask it anyway, maybe in a slightly different context. Um, first of all, this is all really encouraging. The program sounds great. Hopefully, you know, it's things can be replicated and, and, and learn from this. Um, but in the net, in the context of what you're saying, you know, maybe 1,500 units, in the context of the need and of Portland and the size it has, how significant is that? Where do you think it would need to be to be significant? Do you have hopes that it can get there? And when you say it's just one piece of the puzzle, what are the other pieces? Yeah. So, I mean, 1,500 is definitely, it's not unexpected that that's where we would be right now, considering kind of the rush of development that came before. But um, we're hoping and we're seeing, like with development picking up, I think some preliminary data is showing that permitting is back to where it was pre-inclusionary housing um, and rising. So we are seeing more developments come through, which means there's going to be more units overall. Um, and with more units, there will be more IZ units. It's a it's a percentage. Um, the other pieces of the puzzle come from a lot of aspects of the community, like our nonprofit, excuse me, affordable housing developers are a huge piece of that. In fact, I think the biggest piece of that, and th that includes the ones that come through PHB for direct funding. Um, but most of the developers, the nonprofit developers, are doing this through separate funding, right? What you see coming through the bond dollars, that's some of the units, but it's definitely not all of them. And I think those definitely go mostly unreported. And just a, if I can, just a quick uh -huh. follow up, sorry, on that was do you have any sense of what percentage this 1500 right now would be of the need? I, um, so the the, this isn't Portland specific, but um, the recent Oregon Regional Housing Needs Assessment put the need statewide at 584,000 units over the next 20 years. Uh, so that's 30,000 units a year. Nearly half of those for those making less than 80% of AMI. And I think about half of probably both those buckets is in the Portland region. Um, I don't recall if Portland, the city, has set uh, an affordable 
production goal itself, but it is, it's a very big bucket that needs to be filled. Yeah, and so I think alongside the, the numbers of how many uh, more homes we need is also the just continuing sober facts that are coming out from the state of housing report that the Portland Housing Bureau does, which for multiple years in a row, um, I think since inclusionary housing was leave and lifted, that there is no place a single working head of household who is black, indigenous, and a person of color, I think besides the you know API categorization, is able to afford to rent in the city of Portland. So like the, this is the context in which we have to remember why, um, you know, I was described uh, during the campaign that having a preemption was just like having a mute button on the conversation. You were unable to talk about mandating in these newer developments any sort of affordable housing. And this is the context we have to remember is that we're trying to create the housing abundance, the housing options, and then inclusionary housing has to be paired with other housing tools all together in order to, to look comprehensively at um, how we can address this massive need in a very, very skewed market with not enough regulatory tools and not enough buy-in from the federal government as well. Laura? Hey, um, Laura, sorry, I'm just gonna kind of make it taller, okay. <laughs> hey, um, Laura Foote, Media Action. Um, so I don't wanna, I'm gonna be a little, I was so gung-ho on inclusionary because partially because I'm coming from the like, we have a shortage, and this will be the like sprinkle on top that will make people like market rate housing, hooray, right? There's gonna be all these people who are gonna be like, yay, it, it includes infor affordable, and it's a carrot, and, and especially density bonuses, and that it would streamline and speed up housing production. And what I have seen, like, my, and then I, like my, my hopes were, have been dashed repeatedly, and I think maybe it's just because California is like, the place where the worst housing has come from. <laughs> but um, but I do, what I worry, and to your point about the mute button, inclusionary has eaten up so much of the discourse in a lot of places. And it's become, you know, I think that what I thought is like, oh, we'll do 10, 15, 20% affordable, and then we'll get fast, people get to yes faster, and instead, we end up both having the fight at the citywide level of what should the inclusionary rate be, and then again at the project level where we fight again about project by project inclusionary, and it doesn't make anybody like the projects better, and it just makes people like see themselves at war with the developer, like uh, you need to get this project with deeper levels of affordability and more, and, and like it, it just sets it up this very like between both the planners, the outside advocates, and the developer, a lot of like adversarial, nobody trusts anybody else's numbers. Um, and it, it's like, you know, and I'm like, yes, all these numbers are made up. And, <laughs> and so, yeah, I just want to like, can you guys talk about that? Because I was so hopeful and I feel very unhopeful now. Um, on, on the trust component, you just said something um, of not trusting each other's numbers. We were given a locked performa in the, the conversation to really look at, uh, so when we were ready to finally talk about numbers and looking at what the developers were saying, why it didn't pencil out, it was a locked performa PDF. So that's, I think, contributes to some of the distrust on both sides. Um, but Kate, I mean, having, <laughs> I feel like you've written about. Yeah, I, I mean, I've done well, done some modeling of this, and I guess, in my perspective, I, I share your concerns, Laura, having having watched, if not been involved in those discussions of where do you set the numbers and how much time and energy and how acrimonious those debates can get. Um, I think, to the extent that there's not negotiation on a project by project basis. That seems better to me. Um, I've always been skeptical of processes in which it has to get hashed out individually and you know the, real, the wheel has to get reinvented and the angry neighbors get to come out um, for a specific project. I think it is better to have clearer standards up front but right, like is that an IH problem or is that like a democracy problem and a process problem that we have that we allow that to happen at every single scale and that fight to happen? But I, um, yeah, no, I yeah. do think it's important to note that, you know, the, the numbers that you set do really matter and, you know, 20% of zero is zero units. Um, 
so it's yeah it's imp it's important to have you know good numbers driven but also you know trusted conversations um, and fairly frequently because the market changes Benjamin yeah uh, uh, Ben Ross from uh, I'm from Montgomery County Maryland where we've had IZ for like 40 years you should and be up here on the panel <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and, yeah, and I, I wanted to make a couple comments following on. Originally, uh, really one of the main forces getting it passed was the uh, very NIMBY uh, county counselor from the, uh, <clears throat> who said, why is my district getting stuck with all the low-income housing? Everybody else needs to share, and if that happens, we will allow you know, I'll be more pro-housing uh, getting built everywhere. And uh, it has always had a strong consensus, including the business community, for that reason. Um, <clears throat> but it was originally sold and continues to be mostly not, and I believe can only be, a, house, a, so, a housing integration, economic integration program, not a housing production program. Yeah. And it is, in fact, very useful as an integration program, not only because that's extremely important on its own, but also it takes away the ability of any neighborhood to s where there's any building going on to say, uh, you know, no poor people here or no middle-income people here. <clears throat> but to work for that purpose, it, it should not be for, uh, deeply affordable housing. And there's several reasons for that. One is that, you know, I think we all know that for all the talk about not affordable enough, the real objection to new housing is too affordable. And it's like a game that, you know, will make it deeply affordable and then my next door neighbor will come in and say, don't bring the crime here. And, um, this <clears throat> and there's also a practical, a practical reason, which is when you look at the long term of this housing, the economics uh, are only sustainable if the rent level in the affordable units is at least sufficient to cover the maintenance. Um, otherwise, you get into the situation that you have all over the place now of 1980s garden apartment uh, condos that are going broke. Do you, could you share numbers off the top of your head? Do you know like what percent is required in Montgomery County for what AMI? Yeah, it's usually 80. 80% AMI? Yeah, a AMI, and then w there's what they call workforce housing that's more like 100 or 110. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what has uh, happened, it, well, there's a third reason, which is the political reason, <coughs> which is, you know, there's a basic question of political alliances. And if you're going to say, no, 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 that's bad to build housing for people who are in the middle. You, ha you can only build it for the poor and the rich. <laughs> that is a very politically destructive uh, line. And, you know, I'm a believer in the politics of the 99%. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to build housing for the middle class should not be ashamed of building housing for the middle class. And you should never counterpose housing for the poor against the housing for the middle class. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so for all those reasons, I think it's really important to visualize um, inclusionary zoning as a middle class housing pro program for the middle class and aimed at social integration. And where it really works in our area is where you've got these McMansion neighborhoods of million and a half dollar houses, two million dollar houses, and then there are the uh, townhouses uh, in the corner. Yeah, <laughs> thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, and for, for context, I think Portland's program fits within you know, what people think of as middle income. 80% AMI is 54,000 for someone living alone. 77,000 for a family of four, 60% is like 58,000 for a family of four. So it's, it's definitely not the poorest folks 
Yeah, we were definitely talking about teachers and you know mm -hmm. frontline healthcare workers during the campaign as being the exact sort of households that this program would be designed for. Okay, I find this program like it's only creating a small amount of units. It's delaying buildings being built. Um, like I bet you, if you look at the set of incomes, it's all very close to the peak MFI. It, you know, the application process is probably going to be long, which means only locals and insiders are going to get into these, these lower priced units. Why did you choose to focus your efforts on this program versus other affordability, like aimed programs, like vouchers or something like that? From a community perspective? Well, or? you chose this like as a lobbyist to say, hey, we want to change this law and get this open. Why not look like, what about this program did you say, hey, this is the one to go after as opposed to other affordability aimed uh, programs? Sure. Well, as, as an organizer, you know, we're really looking at the entire landscape of what other, uh, what other campaigns were being moved forward and um, who was leading on tenant protections who was leading on some of the housing and zoning reforms. And we didn't have a lot of zoning-based advocates at that time. So inclusionary housing was kind of the first foray for a lot of community-based organizations, especially from the racial justice um, perspective, to, to really um, become more technical and find tools. And so that was just one tool that we saw an opportunity to be able to rally some community members around, but and also across the state, hearing from other jurisdictions, I'm kind of looking at you because I know that you're from Bend, you know, hearing what was happening in growing metropolitan regions and hearing their concerns. And that's what we saw was going to be a reasonable path. I mean, it took three tries in the state legislature. What we saw is a reasonable try um, to try to get um, further integration to Benjamin's point, right, in, in these growing housing markets. So. Um, I can only defend some of that because, you know, having looked back, I'm glad that we did the campaign. I don't know who else would have led the charge um, to lift that preemption. We probably would have had it for a much longer time in the state. Um, and I'm so grateful that, uh, you know, other campaigns came, that, that folks got involved in order to, to do other, the other work as well. And I, I can't speak to Oregon's history, uh, but I can say that many cities, jurisdictions turn to IZ um, as an affordability tool because from a fiscal impact, uh, it's, it's among the cheaper options and it seems like free lunch. I see you rolling your eyes and I, I know, I'm just saying that that's often why. That's often, you know, it's the, the answer is perhaps the obvious one in which, you know, it's, the hidden it's, costs go to other people. Okay. Yeah. All right, Thank you. Oh, welcome, Joe. Hey. We had you on the panel, too. Hi, Joe Courtright from City Observatory. And, you know, what's, what's striking here is, I mean, I think we all agree promoting housing affordability is the policy objective. I think it's still very much a question of whether IZ has improved housing affordability at all. And you can talk about the units that IZ has built, but you can't see the units that aren't built because IZ raises the cost of housing. And we know that there's been a collapse in the housing pipeline in Portland in the last three or four years. In 2016-17, we were having an average of 6,000 new setups uh, for new, new apartments in the, in the city. That's fallen by more than half to 2,600. At the same time, we've created incentives for people to sneak in under the limit by building 20-unit buildings. And the IZ applies not to the development, but to individual buildings. So we have a lot of 15 to 19-unit buildings. What that tells you is this has created really strong incentives to not build housing and to underbuild housing in locations that would support more density. And to the extent that we aren't building housing, that means there are that many more people competing for the existing housing stock. And so I think if we're going to fairly evaluate the impact of any IZ strategy, we really need to understand what its aggregate impacts are on the market. And I think that's been almost completely ignored by PHP, which I think is a critical issue that was pointed out five years ago when this came out, and we haven't had an assessment of it. And the final thing that I would say is there are significant public costs here in terms of the waivers of fees, but in particularly the property tax exemptions. So how much is the public spending 
for these units. So, um, you're, you're all, so there are two costs here. There are these market costs and private costs of the buildings that aren't getting built because of IZ, and there are the additional public costs for the subsidies that we are paying for them. It's a fair question the previous speaker asked is, does this set of policies make any sense compared to all the other policies that we could put in place? Yeah, and Joe, you know, I would really welcome and your, you know, your valid critiques that you've lodged from the very beginning to, you know, I think there's an opportunity to go back to the state and ask for a clean lift of the exemption of, of the tool um, to really look at, you know, the sideboards are restrictive. That's why we have a bunch of 19 unit buildings. If we had a clean lift of that, how much more flexibility could jurisdictions have to really calibrate it to their needs and actually be able to debate the merits of, um, of the zoning policy. Well, that begs the question of whether changing those sideboards would result in more or less housing getting built. And presumably, if you, you know, when you move those around, you create incentives. The point is that this, these, these additional costs that you impose on developers raise the cost of housing, which means less housing gets built, which we know is going to worsen the affordability problem that we face. So Joe, can I ask you, do you think Portland's IZ program can be fixed? And what would that look like to you? Um, I think we're in a really tough spot with IZ because as the as speakers noted, when, when we put the IZ in place, there was a land rush for people to get their uh, projects vested before the IZ requirements took place. So in effect, that buffered us from a lot of the negative effects of the IZ program, at least for a short period of time. So from a game theoretic, standpoint, it worked out great for affordability. We got a big rush of housing <laughs> for a couple of years. Now we're in exactly the opposite situation. Because once we say, you know, we're thinking about lessening these IZ requirements to avoid the constriction of supply, that sends a signal to developers, hey, let's wait a while and see if the city of Portland or the legislature backs off on these. So I think we're in a very, very difficult situation uh, with regard to adjusting this policy. And I think that's something to be aware of. Once you go down this road, um, it's, you, you put yourself in a situation where you can't automatically go back to the status quo ante. Cassie, do you have any thoughts on how this, the city is looking at adjusting the program? Yeah, so there is a calibration study, as I mentioned, about to go on. Obviously, you know, we can't count units that, that aren't there. I, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you how many units would have been built without inclusionary housing. But what I can say is that without inclusionary housing, letting the market do as it wants does not provide, mean that they're gonna provide enough units and restrict them for a long period of time, have affordable rents, right? Naturally occurring affordable rents for workforce housing does not happen. It does not exist. There are some developers that do it, but it's not happening on a large enough scale. There has to be something in place. And it's not a perfect program. We're still working on it. We're still looking at numbers. Some of these questions are much bigger than what PHB can do alone, and it's much bigger than the money we have for the calibration study. Um, and it also would take a lot of kind of cooperation from the private market. There's a lot of data that the private market has that they don't feel comfortable sharing with us. So we don't have anything to really go off of if we're just kind of shooting in the dark and saying, okay, well, I mean, we know what it takes to build an affordable housing project, but all the financing's different, right? And we have some developers that are a little more willing to share, but we don't have enough data to say across the board, this is how much it costs. This is how it's impacting developments as an average. So, I mean, I think that the Housing Bureau is always open to getting more information, to making sure that we're hitting the balance correctly. Um, but you're right. There's a lot that is unknown, and we're doing our best, and we are providing units, you know, um, and we're providing family-sized units. Um, and it could, it could be more, but development is also starting to increase. We are exiting a pandemic. Inclusionary housing slow the market. Um, so we've had a really weird five years. I mean, but so has like the cost of steel and labor yep. and concrete and tariffs. Um, yeah. All of that has happened as well. Um, mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of different factors yeah. that goes into what creates uh, a new market rate building, yeah. um, not just a zoning policy that's calibrated at the city level. Thank you, Vivian.
So hi, I'm Melanie Keebler. Um, I was elected to the Bend City Council in 2020. Congratulations. So I've been in office about a year and uh, change here. And I was really interested in this presentation and want to thank you both for presenting um, because inclusionary zoning, as Laura alluded to, is used as a way to argue we shouldn't build new housing unless it is affordable. And there's a lot of confusion and a lot of assumptions about what an IZ policy will do to the market um, and what neighbors think like, oh, you just make them make it affordable and then they build affordable housing. So, so, uh, <laughs> so we have that conversation constantly and I think it is used a little bit in bad faith too to, to say, you know, you shouldn't be building this, this apartment building. Um, but Bend has had uh, our own city affordable housing fund since 2006 and what we've really dived into um, this new council that came on in, in 2021 probably the most progressive council we've had um, ever. And we set some really strong goals around like, we want a thousand units of affordable housing in the pipeline in the next two years. Um, and we're willing to staff up people and we're willing to direct our committee that, that does those funds to do it. Um, and that's where we put a lot of our time. So what I appreciate about this presentation is hearing about this policy on the ground. I, I wasn't involved with the campaign or anything like that when it was going through the state. I think it's really unfortunate you had to compromise like that because it sounds like that really has hamstrung looking at the policy and seeing if it works like how can you get a good evaluation when you have all these sideboards and things that, that the builders have put onto it um, so for me in this area i definitely agree like i would like to get rid of that preemption there are some areas for cities that i think preemption is good <laughs> especially california cities but also oregon cities but in this case that that ability to try something at a level that works for your city makes sense to me and will it always work or Will it always immediately get what you want? No, but could we couple some sort of IZ with the density bonuses Bend already has, with our affordable housing fund, with, um, I'll touch on, trying to get enough resources for our staff to catch up with the growth? Because that's the other thing too, is thinking about these policies. Do I invest in a staff person to work on this or someone to get permits through to get the housing on the ground, right? So th those are the things that, that trade off, but I really appreciate hearing the background on this and how it got to where it is and I would support in the future like if we go back to the state saying let cities play with this right let them try it in a way that's not so restricted so we can get real data on what works and and what works where so thank you, yeah, thank thank you. you. I think we have time for one more question sorry guys <laughs> all right oh. hi guys my name is Burhan I'm a city councilor of Cambridge Massachusetts um, and uh, both like to comment on people's things before and then to ask my question. Um, like I can just say like, you know, not knowing the numbers or anything like that, like just politically, I find it's really nice to go around and like be able to defend like every new high income tower and being like, yes, there's affordable units in that. And I feel like it makes my job easier politically in that way. Um, the question I have for you guys is around like what you're maximizing for so, for example, in Cambridge, we increased our inclusionary unit uh, percentage to 20%. And I would say that, you know, uh, just making up numbers here, but let's say 1,000 units will be built under that regime. Now we have 200 units that will be affordable. Um, but we've only seen them in a very limited area where there's the most land value. And so, like, you know, there's a reasonable concern that if it was still, like, 10%, that we might get 1,500 units in total, but that would only be 150 affordable. And so there's a trade-off between total number of affordable units and total number of units. And I was just wondering how you guys think about that. I mean, the, the trade-off is real. Uh, one of the things, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're prioritizing family size units, so two bedrooms or more, with reconfiguration. And we, I think um, we see a pretty dramatic decline in total number of IH units because so many larger developments will actually utilize the reconfiguration and they ended up providing about, most of the time I see it ends up being about three to 4% of their total units, but they're all in two bedrooms or larger. So, I mean, I think overall, it, it, I think it just has to be flexible, right? Um, the more flexibility you can build in, you can adapt to the market um, and, and kind of decide what the priorities are. Um, I don't know how we find the right ratio um, because it's changing every day. And yeah, we, we could say we just want the most units at once. You know, we're going to assume that they're going to take and, and build this many units. 
um, but they change their mind. Things happen with financing, um, other zoning changes. Um, so I think just figuring out what is most needed in the community and kind of sticking with that is is the only guidance I can kind yeah, of Yeah, the context give. is really important. So again, yeah. with the state of housing report really showing where the lack of affordability is and mm -hmm. for whom um, really in, helped inform some of the design of the IH policy at the city level, including you know this buy down to affordability to 60% MFI, which is extraordinarily difficult um, in different zones of the city, you know, whether it's Central yeah. City or other parts as well. Um, but really, you know, with the guidance of our elected officials and you know what the goals of the program are, where we want to see those um, households being able to access opportunity, where there's very where there's density of transit, knowing the jobs that they're most likely to get, all of those factors really came into the crafting of Portland's IH policy, and also um, was part of what allowed us to organize so many different diverse communities to this issue. We're almost at noon. Any final closing thoughts from Kathy or Vivian? You know, so I almost didn't want to be on this panel, partially because, you know, inclusionary zoning has been raked over so much um, in the news and critiqued so much. Um, and all of these critiques, I think, are fairly valid um, in their own form. But again, it's about the context. And so, you know, when uh, even, you know, working in the Cully neighborhood, which I don't believe has any inclusionary, uh, you know, zoning units on site, you know, like community members don't give a crap about this. They, you know, what they care about is that, you know, the rent's still too damn high. The job is still too far away, and you know the, the the access to opportunity is still lacking in you know one of the the highest developing cities in the wealthiest country in the entire nation. I mean that's one of the goal, and I think it's the challenge for us is to try to figure out what are what are the sort of tools um, that we can identify, what are the sort of policies that we can enact to help address some factor in those community members' lives. Um, and that's what I keep coming back to as an advocate and why I keep saying yes to coming on these dang panels to talk about inclusionary housing because it's not, because it's, yeah, we can do better. We can do better. We need to do a lot more. Um, and so let's try, let's try to continue to agitate through it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was kind of with Vivian. I actually, Matt Schaubold was supposed to be here. So I apologize for any of you who are looking forward to seeing him. Um, <laughs> I'm not a policy person. So this is. Um, but inclusionary housing is pretty much my life for, you know, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Um, and, and it's always been a, a big passion of mine. So I think even though this program has a lot of growth that it can, you know, um, it needs to go through um, and it will continue to change over the course of time, I think it's a start. And you all... The biggest thing is just putting something down and starting and leaving yourself some flexibility and grace to know that it's not going to be perfect. But if you don't start, it's never going to get there. So. Words of wisdom. Okay. Thank you all. And uh, just to pitch, there's probably enough content here or follow-up questions you guys have for an unconference session. So remember yeah. that that's always an option. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thank you.